Okay, so uh, here we have, uh, this, is a, um, this is a difficult question. So I'm not sure if this is, we should start with this one. We can start with this one. Uh, but this uh, question is, um, what is the meaning of, yeah, this, is the, um, uh, this is a famous expression you find in the suttas. It's called the Majje Sutta, in the middle sutta. And it's about things that are in the middle. And uh, so, I, so the question is, contact is one end. The arising of contact is the other end. Cessation of contact is in the middle. Craving is the seamstress. Yeah, so uh, what does this mean? And it's one of those riddles you find in the Sudas. There's a large number of things that are said to be, there's a verse that is spoken, and then different monks giving different interpretations, and then the Buddha finally giving his interpretation. So uh, craving is the seamstress. Well, the way you can think of craving as the seamstress is that craving sews together one life to the next one. Yeah, It kind of creates the continuity from one existence to the next. And this is the way that craving is the, the seamstress. It binds things together. It kind of ties things together. And this is kind of the, uh, the idea behind this. And uh, what it is binding together is uh, contact on the one hand and arising of the contact on the other. And the, the one, there's a number of ways these things can be interpreted. Often when you're dealing with verse, it can be quite complicated. So you have contact, and then the arising of contact can be understood as the arising in a new life. When it arises in a new, new life, uh, well, the reason why that happens uh, is because of craving. Yeah? Otherwise, contact would not arise in a new life. You wouldn't have any more experiences. Uh, so experience arises through this connection via craving, in a sense. Uh, so this is one way to understand this. Uh, and then the ending of craving is in the middle. But is, it is in the middle because if you end the craving, uh, then there is no arising in the future life. So it stops before you get to that point. It doesn't go to that other end, which is the arising at the other side. Yeah. So something like that, I think, is probably the most likely meaning here. But uh, to be able to give you a full explanation, I would have to contemplate a little bit because it's one of those cryptic verses that are... Uh, it's full, probably full of meaning, yeah? lots and lots of meanings in this, uh, and many ways of regarding it and thinking about it. Uh, and uh, so I would uh, have to contemplate it a bit. Which, can you remember which sutta this is? Uh, 661, aha. Actually, this is why, why Yang comes on every retreat. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's really 661. Let's see, see where it is. Uh, I don't think it has been... Um, it has been, and there's no comments on it yet from Bhanta Sujata, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, 661. So let's have a look. So this is, uh, for, for anyone of you who was interested in the suit, it's very useful to know this particular website. Yeah, so this, is, this website is called suttacentral.net, and it has all the suttas. So you have here, you have the discourses over here. Yeah, and then this is translated, most of this is translated by Bhanta Sujata, but there's also translations by Vicky Boda there, by Ajanta Nisra and other people. This here, monastic law, this is mostly my translations. Sir. So if you want to read my translations, you can find them here. Find them here. So, this is the Vinaya Pitika. But now we're dealing with the discourses. Sir. So 661 says uh, Yin. So we will uh, go. So this you can see here, you can also buy the books now. They can be bought online. You can get them from uh, lulu.com or something. So you can actually just press here, and then you get the book. Yeah, so you can actually buy the book, Volume 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, paperback, uh, various versions, PDF, EPUB, uh, and then the discussion. Uh, here is the author. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll let that be for now. Uh, so we go here, numerical discourses. You have 11 books. These are called 11 Nipatas. And uh, so the book of ones, twos, threes, uh, and down to 11. And this one is the book of six, is the sixth volume. And there's altogether lots of suttas. Uh, uh, this is 61. So we go, go here and we go the great chapter and we go to number 61. So in the middle, right? Majja Sutta, just as I mentioned before. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, here you can see exactly the one there that we're just talking about. Yeah, contact is one that. Uh, 
original contact is the second and cessational contact is in the middle and craving is the seamstress. Uh, there you have it. Uh, this is found right there. Let me um, see if I can uh, bring up an alternative translation. Do you hope you don't mind me messing around a little bit like this? If you think I mess around too much, uh, please complain to Bobby and he will let me know. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we have all the various suttas, uh, suttas, nikayas in English. Uh, we have the Bhikkhu Bodhis translations over here somewhere. Draft, uh, index. Uh, uh, then we have the uh, sixes, uh, and we have 61, 64, 63, 62, 61. So here is the discourse. Uh, so here, uh, probably very hard for you to see because it's such a small point. Let me expand it a bit. That's better, is that better? Now it's really, really large. So let me just find the suit again now because everything has been displaced because of the expansion. Sixty-one. Let's go here. Sona Sutta. Lots of nice suttas in here. Ah, in the middle. So now you can see, right? So this is the. Um, this is quite interesting because you can see here that uh, this particular verse that you see here, having understood both ends, the wise one does not stick in the middle. Uh, I call him a great man. He has, he has here transcended the seamstress, uh, right? This is taken from something called the Par Parayanabhaga. Parayanabhaga is found in the Sutta Nipata. It's a very famous collection of verses. This is the fifth collection, fifth chapter in that collection of verses, uh, and it's called the Parayana Vaga. And there's this a group of uh, a students of a very famous Brahmin. One of these students is called Metea, and they co all go to the Buddha together and ask him these very profound questions. And this is one of those questions. And this is here referred to in the Sutta, in the Anguttara Nikaya, it refers to this other collection. Yeah, So you can imagine this must be very ancient verses because they are referred to elsewhere. Uh, and then they are explained here. <clears throat> and so this is the question, right? And now the question is, well, what, friends, is the first end? What is the second end? What is the middle? And what is the seamstress? Yeah? So they are having a discussion about the meaning of this particular verse, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, the monks come together, they discuss the teaching of the Buddha, and they find the meaning of these things. And of course, what you find is that a verse like this can be understood in many different ways. It doesn't have one meaning. It can have many different meanings. And this is very interesting because the idea of verse in Pali is to inspire you. You know, verse, if you have prose, and prose is basically very straight down the, uh, you know, straight on. Yeah, it doesn't have many kind of uh, uh, different meanings. But verse is often very complicated. It's meant to inspire. It can have many different kind of meanings. And so it is also in this particular case. And uh, so that's when we read verse, we should have an open mind as to try to understand what it means. Uh, many different angles to come from her. Uh. But one of the things that everyone says is that the seamstress is always craving, uh, because craving is what ties the, the, the lives together, one life after the next one, all the way along. Yeah? So this is kind of an important principle for all of these explanations that we have here. Uh. And here we come to the very first one. Yeah. Contact is one end. The rise of contact is the second end. Cessation of contact is the middle. Craving is the seamstress. Seamstress is a, 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 someone who sows, someone who is a professional sower. For craving, and here you go, craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. It's, in other words, it sows rebirth. It is in this way that a bhikkhu directly knows what should be directly known, etc. So this is um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Let's see what he has to say in terms of uh, these footnotes. Wow, very small. Huh? Uh, so, um, 1396. Uh, Ah, 
ah, no luck. <laughs> this is terrible. Why does it do this? <laughs> uh, so much dukkha. Why now is it the wrong size already? Huh? Ah. <laughs> okay, this is great. Okay. Thank you so much, Ryan. That's, this is wonderful. Uh, so the contact at the first end is one individual existence, which is produced by way of contact. Okay, so one in the, the contact at one end is one individual existence, which is produced by way of contact. Is it? I guess contact leads to craving or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but anyway, the origin of contact. Pasasamuddha is the second end, is the future existence. This is exactly what I was saying. So I've probably read this before, and it's always in my subconscious. So not because I'm wise, just because I, my memory is kind of kind of working. That's probably why. Yeah. Produced with the contact of the kamma done in this existence as its condition. The cessation of the contact, Pasaniroda, is Nibbana. Nibbana is said to be in the middle because it cuts in half, craving the seamstress. Cuts craving in half, so half of craving is here, the other half is here. <laughs> it, in my opinion, okay, so here's Bikki Bodhi's opinion. In my opinion, it would make better sense to see Pasaniroda here, not as Nibbana, but as the ceasing of contact at the end of the first existence. Craving is then the seamstress because it ties the contact of yeah, to the initial arising of uh, contact in the new existence. Okay, so that's pretty much what I said before. So uh, Bikibodi agrees with me. <laughs> no, it's I who agree with Bikibodi. I don't get it right way around. I'm just being naughty here. So, um, Yeah, so does that, uh, does that make even any, does that make a little bit of sense? Yeah, but as I said, these things are often quite complex because they are verses, so they can have many meanings. So that is just a preliminary meaning for you. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Ajahn, thank you so much for your kind and full of metta session. Okay, I'm glad you are enjoying it. In your book of... Uh, of 89 or of what? Could you please kindly explain more on Anguttara 11.2? Thank you for enlightening us. I, am, I cannot guarantee to enlighten you. That's up to you to enlighten yourself. <laughs> but I can, uh, <laughs> I can talk about this one. So this is, I believe, a version of the famous Chaitanya Sutta. And because it is a version of the Chaitanya Sutta, I, this is actually part of the second part of this retreat. Uh, so you, it will come whether you want to or not, uh, you're going to have to go through that sutta. So uh, let's have a quick look. Yeah, making a wish. So this is part of the Chaitanya Sutta, 11.2. Yeah. So we're going to look at this one anyway. And uh, it's a very beautiful sutta, one of the suttas that I always teach on these retreats. Uh, so some of you will have heard the sutta many times, and I hope you will forgive me for teaching it again. So we shall see how that goes. Uh, Okay, next one. Thank you, Ajahn, for your inspiring book, Flowing to Freedom, A Joyous Ride to Awakening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. This, these are questions, are really nice questions. This is, kind of, this, this is great, isn't it? Just uh, thanking you for the nice book. Yeah. This book was put together by a nun, a nun called Venerable Karunika. She is now the uh, abbot, the head nun of a Santi monastery in Sydney. And she put it together simply for the reason of raising funds for her monastery, because they are... Uh, buying a new Bihara in the city, in Sydney. Uh, and that is to get closer to people, to enable better teaching and these kind of things. Uh, and so she said, oh, maybe we can put, to, you know, we need to do some fundraising. We can combine fundraising with Dhamma. Let's see, maybe we can put together a book. Uh, so I wrote an email to Bobby. I said to Bobby, you, would, would you like to make, raise some funds for us? Uh, Bobby said, uh, it was a bit reluctant to begin with, but eventually, <laughs> eventually we got through and he said, sure, let's do it. So, Thank you so much, Bobby, for being being helpful and for helping out. That's that's wonderful, man. So uh, that's great. So when you if you buy that book, if you enjoy it, it's wonderful. But also remember that you're also helping 
a monastery at the same time as you do so. Yeah, so it has a double kind of benefit, uh, and this is great. So don't think of it as buying a book. Think of it as making a donation to the monastery. Yeah, that's the best way of thinking about these kind of things. Uh. All right, <coughs> dear Ajahn. Ever since my children was introduced to the terminology cause and conditions, they have been using it to their advantage, I feel. <laughs> I want to guide them that one must also put in effort to achieve one's goals. But then again, they replied, even with the effort, it still comes back to cause and conditions, whether the effort will be fruitful. Um, without the effort, no fruit guaranteed, Yeah, so that you can tell them that. So effort is one condition, and some conditions are required. If those conditions are missing, guaranteed, no fruit. No effort, zero fruit, guaranteed. Uh, if you want even half an apple, uh, you've got to put in the causes of getting that half an apple. Uh, one of the causes of getting half an apple is to give a Dhamma talk and then go down to lunch afterwards. Uh. <laughs> so it's like a yo-yo, Ajahn, and I'm really at a loss on how to reply to them. This is how you reply. You remember, that effort is one of the causes and conditions. Uh, there are also other causes and conditions, true, uh, but without effort, you know, nothing is going gonna, is gonna to work out. And uh, so, uh, but I think you're doing the right thing because you are kind of finding a way of doing it with a sense of kindness. Yeah. And I, I can sense that the way you're writing is a, is a kind of positive way of, of dealing with this. So, uh, yeah, you say to your kids, yeah, just explain how, you know, how, uh, how causality works, that all kind of causes have to be put into place. It is not just the causes that they, and of a hoping will fall into place, but other causes too, like hard work and uh, and all of these kind of things that uh, also have to happen. Uh, I think that's really all you have to do. Uh, and uh, I don't know what will they say. They're trying to kind of think about the mind of the children, what they will say in resp <laughs> response to that. Uh, what will they say? They will say that, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think also. It is about uh, what are the, ultimately, what are the causes or conditions of happiness in this world, right? What is it that makes people happy? Yeah? And having a degree of success in life, having a degree of feeling of mastery is a very important part of happiness. Uh, if you don't do things well, uh, you never really, you know, everything has to be done well. The better you do things, the more satisfied you tend to be afterwards. Uh, and uh, so this is, I think, a very important part. So you have to ask them, well, what are the causes and conditions of happiness in the future? Part of that, putting in the effort now. Uh, if you want to be miserable in the future, you're putting in the cause and conditions now, but not doing anything. Uh. <laughs> so you have to uh, make them see. Yeah? And this is kind of, uh, I think, look at someone like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, he's a very, he's always been very, very hardworking and putting in a lot of effort in everything that he does. And he's also just about the happiest person in, uh, I was going to say the universe, that's probably going too far. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he's in a large, certainly in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Bodhinyana, <laughs> probably more than Bodhinyana, probably maybe in all of Perth even. And the reason, part of the reason for that is because of all this hard work. Yeah, I mean, he, he was a very good, he, got a first-class honors from Cambridge University in theoretical physics. He's very intelligent. Uh, you wouldn't believe it because he's very humble. You would never think that he's like, oh, he just seems like this kind of very ordinary monk, you know. Uh, and then he worked incredibly hard establishing monasteries. Uh, I mean, like really, really hard, like seven in the morning to seven at night, seven days a week, uh, week in, week out, uh, yeah. And still he said he wasn't using his time well enough. I, I don't know what he means by that, but anyway, that's what he says, uh, yeah. And he is very happy, and part of the reason is because he has done so much service. Yeah, all that service, all that goodness, the sense of self worth, self value that comes from working well and doing the right thing is a very important component in happiness. And so, if your kids want to be happy, tell them that this matters. Yeah, effort is actually very important in life, but not stupid effort, intelligent effort. Yeah, effort where you feel good about yourself, not where you burn yourself out. That's also not, not a good idea. We shouldn't burn ourselves out either. So something like that, yeah? And uh, good luck. Children are usually very clever in coming with comebacks, so I, <laughs> it's always kind of, it's a kind of a, uh, a war where you, you know, never really know what's going to happen next, but uh, anyway. I never had children, you know? I, sometimes I think, oh, lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I apologize. If, I, I'm sure that there are many nice things about having children, right? I, I, I recognize that. But uh, there's also many nice things about not having children. So. <laughs> Okay, next one. Sukihotu Ajan. Appreciate if you can explain further the paragraph which states that where there is no I, no sight, no consciousness, for those without basic sutta studies with Ajan, they may take it literally. And to make matters worse, such phrases are taken out of context by other religions. Many thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, it, it, this will surprise you. It is supposed to be taken literally. Yeah. <laughs> It is a literal meaning, yeah. but it is also very profound, and that's why I kind of went over it fairly fast, because I didn't really want to get into the profundities of this, yeah. because uh, Buddhism is kind of very, very unique religion, yeah. and uh, the profundity of Buddhism is actually that the highest happiness is to end things, yeah. and the more things you end, the higher is the happiness, yeah. and it's very, very difficult to comprehend without having some insight into especially the idea of non-self, yeah. So uh, other religions may kind of, uh, may, what did you say, taken out of context by other religions, they, they may well kind of say that this is bad, but that's because they don't understand. Yeah, that's the problem. That is precisely the problem. Right? So if other religions say this, they just haven't got a clue what's going on. And, you know, I, you don't really have to listen to that. Uh, um, but uh, you can start to get the feeling for this by, in your meditation, as you meditate, things start to fade away and cease, right? So the deeper your meditation, the less you experience the five senses, for example. After a while, all that is left is maybe just the breath. All, everything else has gone. How does that feel? It feels beautiful. It feels peaceful. It feels profound. Often there will be joy coming with those things. Then you take it even deeper. The breath starts to fade away. And the powerful bliss of meditation can start to arise in your mind it feels just extraordinary. These are the experiences that give you a sense of meaning in your life, yeah? a meaning beyond the ordinary. These are extremely meaningful things. And the more things fade away, the less that remains, the more powerful, the more interesting, the more meaningful the experience is. And you can see where this is leading, right? It's leading towards less and less and less until everything is gone. And that is the highest possible happiness that is, uh, is achievable. And this is what this is saying. Yeah. So uh, it is very, very profound and very kind of hard to understand. Yeah. But uh, you do get some sense for this as your meditation deepens and you see things fading away. That's how I recommend you to uh, contemplate this. So. Yeah? Maybe? Yeah? I, <laughs> wanna, anyone want to say anything about that? Venerable... venerable uh, you want to say something? Okay. Don't want to say? Okay. She so doesn't want to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we will, uh, I will let it be. But you're very welcome to ask this question again because uh, I, I do recognize that some of these things are profound and maybe not so easy to uh, make sense of, as they say. Uh, okay. Let's put that one to one side. Uh, we go on to the next one. Hello, Ajahn. These questions are for my children. Okay. <laughs> That's very nice. So uh, how are they going to get this? Are they going to listen to the video afterwards? What are they going to do? Okay. So hello, children. Hope you are well. So <laughs> I'm talking to you directly now. Okay. So you, you will know who you are. So you, I don't have to say anything more. So... Uh, uh, I'm just uh, I'm going to answer these questions and uh, sort of listen carefully, right? <laughs> I'm the naughty monk from Australia. So here we go. Question number A. Why, oh why, must they learn the life of a Buddha year after year, especially the seven steps of a Buddha immediately after birth? Their eyes rolling as they express this, Ajahn. Please enlighten our Dhamma teachers, Ajahn. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, the life of the Buddha is actually, when it is taught in the right way, is actually incredibly inspiring. It's one of the most inspiring stories in the whole Pali Canon. And I do not mean the seven steps of the Buddha after he was born, that I, I agree with you, I do not uh, 
emphasize such teachings, and I think they are very likely to be a little bit late, not really coming from the Buddha himself. I'm not so interested in that. Uh, if your teacher teaches you those things, it is because it is part of the usual kind of story of the Buddha, and they probably want to give you a complete education. At least you know it is there, and so you know you can reject it. Yeah? If you didn't know it was there, you didn't, know, you didn't have the possibility of rejecting it. So this is kind of the nice thing about it. So look at it that way. And then once you know that, then you can go to the really inspiring part of the story of the Buddha. And of course, the inspiring part of the story of the Buddha is that the Buddha discovered the highest happiness that human beings can experience. The Buddha discovered the end of suffering. He discovered the meaning of life. What more can there be than the meaning of life? Yeah, and if you kind of get a little bit of a handle on the idea that, that life actually does have a big meaning to it, and that is available through the Buddha, you would be so happy if you can understand that. Because it means you have this awesome teacher, the greatest spiritual master in human history, who is available to you. Isn't that wonderful? So this is the right way of thinking about it. The Buddha solved the largest problems in life. The largest problems in life are death. Yeah, you too, even though you are kids right now, you're going to die one day, right? Yeah, you know that already, but, you know, yeah? And that is kind of difficult, yeah? We're going to die, we're going to lose everything we have, all of these kind of things. Well, the Buddha had the answer to those things, and that is what is so extraordinary about the Buddha. So never allow yourself to feel depressed or whatever because you have to learn the seven steps of the Buddha <laughs> as a child, yeah? That is not the important thing. Remember that it is these things are just pointing to the faith of people in the Buddha at a certain point. And maybe sometimes that faith was uh, expressed a little bit excessively, a little bit too much, uh, but it points to something else behind that, uh, something very beautiful and very powerful. And if you have this in your life, uh, you have something extraordinarily powerful in your life that you can take with you from now until the way, the way time you die, uh, and it will make your life much more meaningful and happy as a consequence. So, so uh, yeah, try to see it in perspective. That's my recommendation. Uh, okay, question number B. Why are Asuras considered part of the Deva realm, considering the hot-tempered demeanor? Okay, so Asuras. Um, yeah, first of all, congratulations on understanding that they are part of the Deva realm, because not everyone understands that. Some people say it's part of the lower realms, but I agree with you, they are part of the Deva realm. And uh, the thing is that the Deva Loka, especially the lower Deva Lokas, they are very similar to the human realm. Yeah, if you read in the suttas about the devas, they had children, they would scold their children, the children would misbehave, they would fall in love with each other, yeah, and they would... There's a famous love song found in the suttas about one of these devas. And uh, all of these things. And so they are very similar to the human realm, except a little bit more happy, more kind of power, more of these kind of things. And for that reason, they also have wars. And one of the wars, of course, is the wars between the devas and the asuras. Yeah, it's not exactly like a war like we have, because when we have wars on the human realm, we tend to die and that sort of thing. And in the Deva realms, they normally don't die. They just get tied up by these bonds, yeah? And then they, after a while, they kind of let them loose again, and they're okay. Yeah? But uh, basically, it's a, it's a glorified version of the human realm. Yeah? And uh, so it is not, yeah, it is nice, but it's actually not that nice. Yeah? And this is kind of very interesting about it, because it means that even though it is great to be reborn as a deva, actually, in the end, that too is not all that satisfactory. That too has similar kind of problems as we have as humans. You get attached, you have wars, and yes, you get angry sometimes, like these hot-tempered asuras, yeah? And so it is not as great as you think, and that is why we have the Buddha's teachings. Ultimately, it takes you beyond the whole cycle of existence, including all of these deva realms. Okay, kids, so I'm <laughs> very happy to answer your questions. So please carry on, bring in more questions if you wish. I'm very happy to answer more of those. So best of luck with the Buddhist path, yeah, and take care. Okay, so that is for your kids. <laughs> so, okay, last question for today here. Dear Ajahn Brahm Ali, Sukihotu and welcome back. It is always a joy to attend your class. Can you share some of the answers and responses Ajahn Ganha gave to you when you visited him in Thailand? Please share if it is no trouble. 
is directly quoted from the sutta that we had before. So that's kind of nice. So. Um, all right. Uh, so what did he say when I was in Thailand? Uh, um, he, the thing about Ajahn Gandha is that uh, some of these teachers, it is more their presence than what they say that is interesting. Yeah. yeah? A lot of the things they say are uh, kind of ordinary. Huh? Yeah, they are not kind of super duper marvelous, amazing. Yeah. What is amazing is their kind of their personality and how they behave. That is what is very interesting. Yeah. And because the personality is so strong and powerful, even the simple things become powerful too yeah. through the personality of the person, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So what people say, it is not the content that is the most important thing very often. It is where it is coming from is often more important. Yeah. We can have someone sitting here and saying things like, uh, you know, like Ajahn Brahm can say something and then a junior monk can say something, uh, say exactly the same thing. Uh, and you will listen to Ajahn Brahm, but you won't listen to the junior monk. Too. You know what I mean? Uh, and that has to do with the presence of somebody, with the depth of somebody. You should never go by seniority alone because seniority alone is not so important. Yeah? You can, it's possible to have a junior monk who actually is very wise. So you should listen uh, but uh, you can often feel the qualities of having been a monk for 50 years. Uh, that quality will often shine through. Uh, and you can feel that. And then you listen in a very different way. Uh. And to me, that is the most important teaching with uh, uh, Ajahn Ganha. It's just the presence of a person like that. Uh. And there's a nice story with Ajahn Ganha. We had, uh, I think I've probably told this before, but anyway, it's a nice little story. We had this group in Perth. And Ajahn Ganha had stayed in Perth for about six months. This was back in 1988. He stayed with us for a very long time, and he also visited us later on, so I got a chance to meet him. And one of the stories was after he had gone back to Thailand, this group in Perth said, oh, we, we want to learn meditation from Ajahn Ganda. He was a really cool, cool, cool dude. So we want to kind of have a, we want to have a chat with him and see what he teaches about meditation. And so they got this group together, and I think Ajahn Brahm was there. He kind of led them to Thailand, yeah, and uh, they... Uh, I came to Ajahn Ganda, finally they're going to see the great master. And then we're going to ask him about real meditation. He knows the real deal when it comes to meditation. Yeah? And so they are, Venerable Sir, please teach us meditation. And he said, breathe in, sabai. Breathe out, sabai. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and they had paid thousands of dollars coming from Australia all this way just to be taught this two sentences. <laughs> Please teach us more, teach us more. It's not enough. We want to hear more. And, uh, but actually, when you think about it, uh, yeah, it is a very powerful teaching. Yeah. Sabai in Thai means like relax, be at ease, yeah, enjoy or something like that. If you really can relax and breathe in, really be at ease, not forcing the breath, not doing anything, you will achieve samadhi as a consequence. Yeah, it works. And so the point is that if you follow those teachings fully, they will have the desired effect. and It will actually work. Yeah. Of course, sometimes we need a bit of extra yeah, to kind of get us on the right track and things. Uh, but essentially, these are that's really all you need in a sense. Uh, and so that's kind of how these things come about. Uh. And um, so, um, yeah, so I was, I must admit, I asked that kind of quite a large number of questions when I was there. Uh, and uh, I would, there was nothing really that stood out in my mind as kind of an extraordinary answer. It's, it's strange, isn't it, to go there? Uh, and I think I just enjoyed the presence of someone with so much loving kindness, so much, uh, you know, good feeling about him, good vibes. Uh, and he's like a magnet. He's like, uh, he draws people to him. Uh, and it's kind of very interesting. You sit there with him and you see people that just sit around him, yeah? And often he doesn't say very much. He kind of just, uh, you know, says a few nice little things and he laughs a bit and he throws out some sweets for everyone and he, he pats them on the head with this long stick that he has, yeah. Everyone is just so happy, yeah, just to be there. Yeah. And this is kind of beautiful, yeah, because it, it's, it's, kind of, it's the vibe, it's the juju, yeah, that matters. Uh, you know the word juju? Juju, you know juju? No? Okay, juju is the modern word for vibe, yeah, it used to be called vibe, now it's called juju, <laughs> I, I was in California not so long ago, and they said, no, no, not vibe. Juju is, is the kind of latest word. So I, after I've been starting saying juju all the time. So the juju with Ajahn Ganha is really powerful. Yeah? So that's kind of the, uh, the right word to use. Uh. Juju means vibe. But, but juju means vibe. The vibration, the vibe. Yeah, the, the, the juju is good. A good juju. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
So uh, that is. Uh, I'm just trying to trying to think what happened when I was there. It's already almost five years ago now, so it's kind of uh, faded in memory. I have, think we have some uh, old. Uh, um, well, you went to visit Arangandha Venerable, uh, didn't you? Uh, yeah. What did ha what happened to you? Uh? <laughs> and this. And uh, he he was the giving talk to a lay people, hmm. and then many monks uh, in back of him. And then uh, when I came in, and he 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 said that. He told his mom to uh, get me a chair. Ah, so he, he he said I have a uh, you know leg problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I yeah, was you know pretty far from yeah. from from him. That's nice. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and he knew that I. He said I used uh, line application. <laughs> Don't you want? Oh, you okay. know. You know, like uh, Facebook, it's like uh, the Instagram uh, line. In Thailand, we use line application. Uh -huh. It's a, uh, what do you call it? It's like a, uh -huh. you know. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then, you know, and yeah. then he just talked. So I I uh, said to him, well, go on with your talk. So I was <laughs> So I just there listen uh -huh. to him, and then he asked uh, his monk to give me a, a bottle of honey. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he only gave me but the other piccone didn't get one. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But then, uh, you know, yeah. after that, and he was just talking to the yeah. lay people. Okay. Well, between uh, him and uh, Ajahn Brahm, who's more senior? I think uh, Ajahn Gandha is like one or two years in here. Oh. Very, very close, yeah. So I was just wondering when they met, when he went to uh, Bodhiyana, mm. did, you, did you notice that they read each other's mind? <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, no, I just no. <laughs> They must have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard to know what, what, what happens in other people's minds. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. That's good. I'm glad he treated you well. That's kind of that's nice to hear. So uh, yeah. Okay, so we are anyway coming close. Do we have a, let's just do a short meditation together before we close on. Are you okay with that? Just to kind of chillax a bit? Okay, great. So let's do that. <laughs> 